So our next speaker is one of the most prominent thinkers of our time in artificial intelligence. His work has been praised from everyone, from Elon Musk to Bill Gates. He's the founder of the prestigious Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford University. And in conversation with CNBC's Steve Kovac, please welcome Nick Bostrom. All right, came all the way from Oxford. Actually, just not. To tell from Montreal. Us. Yeah, it's yeah. great. Um, so I want to start off broadly because AI has been a topic of this conference and just the tech community at large. A lot of these people are building products that are incorporate AI. I feel like there are many different definitions, especially today, what AI is. Why don't you talk about where we are now? What is artificial intelligence? Well, it's really become machine learning. It used to be about building expert systems in yeah. the 50s and 60s and 70s. Now it's all about crafting algorithms that, that can learn from experience, rather, rather like, like the human brain. So that's really what created this wave of excitement, the deep learning revolution, uh, and the continued momentum, just applying the same set of tools, scaling it up, some small tweaks, and it just seems to work. Right. So. When, when people talk about AI now, they're really talking about machine learning, not AI in the sense like it uh, you know, can think on its own and, and become an independent thought like we think of it in sci-fi. It's more algorithms and, and things like that, right? Well, I mean, I think it's all algorithms in, in there as yeah. well. Um, you could say that perception really is what started to become possible to automate. So we have computers now that can see and hear and also, you can run generative models, so you can produce visual outputs, uh, photorealistic images of faces or other objects, or, or generate speech. Mm -hmm. This used to be completely impossible with good old-fashioned AI, but with this deep learning approach, that's possible. So perceptual uh, capabilities are now automatable, not so much yet the conceptual stuff. I think that's the next frontier. Right. So what makes people so excited about AI now? When I talk to companies ranging from the biggest ones like Apple down to the tiniest startup, they're all trying to inject AI into their products, and there's a lot of excitement around it. Why, why is that excitement there, and, and why now, especially the last couple of years? Well, at any given point of time, there are always some sort of buzzwords and cool things. like it's. Uh, you know, five years ago, it was like the cloud, everything, the cloud, this, the cloud, that, right. right? And it's become AI. Now, I actually think there is substance to the hype in this case. And I think it's really two things. One is what we already are able to do has a lot of applications. Being able to detect patterns in large data sets and, and do this kind of sensory processing. That's useful for a lot of different things, and you just need to figure out how to use it. Right? If you run a big logistics center, and you can detect patterns in the demand curve a little bit better. So you could forecast, maybe a few percent better forecast. Yeah, you could reduce stockpiles and, and save some money, right? Or, so I think that's part of it. But then the other thing that lies in the background is this sense of what AI might become. That's really what I'm most interested in, not right. near term, but the longer term, where I don't see it. I, I don't, I, I don't see it stopping. I, I don't know how long it will take, but I think the train will keep going until you're able to automate everything that the human brain can do. It might take a while, but it suddenly seems not this completely science fiction thing, but something that you could kind of squint at and see, well, we need a couple of more breakthroughs and stuff, but it looks like we're heading in that direction. So, and so that, that's then a much, much bigger thing right, than, than a cool new buzzword. So you're saying it's working more in the background, not necessarily some kind of robot or something we're talking to? Or, or what, what does that mean exactly? Well, if you think about it, what, what it would mean right, to automate cognition, um, that's the last invention we'll ever need to make. If, if you could, if you could yeah, automate the thing that does the inventing. Mm -hmm. So, so that, that, that hypothetical point is, I think, the most important thing that will ever happen in human history. And that, um, that this kind of pivot point Right, of Earth originating intelligent life. Um, that's less immediately relevant for people trying to get investment in their startup, but I think more relevant for people as human beings, given that this is something that might happen in, in the lifetime. 
awful lot of people today. So I want to talk a little bit about the dark side of AI. I know, I know you're thinking forward in the future, but as people out here are building their products now, there are a lot of dangers and things to think about as they're building these products. I mean, I think the, one of the biggest things that comes to everyone's mind is what Facebook is going through right now with the spread of misinformation and so forth. And their messaging is, this is a problem that can be fixed by AI. This is a problem that we can develop these AI tools <clears throat> that can scan posts, that can scan the content people are putting on, that can get ahead of it. Uh, they claim they're able to take things down even before anyone sees them, but obviously it's not perfect. Um, when, a, when a massive company and a massive community online of people of, of two billion plus are being governed by an AI, what kind of things does Facebook or another company like that have to be thinking about? A lot, I guess a lot of things. I mean, it's, it's just intrinsically impossible task, more or less. I mean, if, if you're trying to set some kind of norms for two billion people in different cultures, and, I mean, it's almost surprising there hasn't been more difficulties with that than there has been. So they can't um, do it, or? Well, you, you just model through, and, and pe some people are going to hate you no matter what you do, probably literally speaking, wh whatever you do. There's probably no possible action that will not result in a large number of people hating you if you are Mark Zuckerberg. That's just like the nature of these things. So think of any political figure, right? Mm. So they're always going to be hated by some segment of the population, no matter how good it is. So, so then scale that up to 2 billion and divide the constituency to different parts of the world. Um, I think maybe if you could like hide more behind the algorithm, so have, I mean, maybe the, the privacy drive is like, oh, we can't even see what people are doing, so you can't blame us if they are sending bad stuff to one another. M might, might be one way to kind of put a little distance between you and the thing you built. Um, but yeah, and there's also this notion that um, AI, well, as we define today, these machine learning algorithms, as you called it, uh, the people behind those algorithms are the ones programming it, telling it what to look for. And one of the criticisms we often hear is the, the lack of diversity in the tech industry, especially at the top, especially at the big companies. Uh, it's largely uh, white men programming these algorithms, and that uh, has the after effect of creating biases that maybe weren't thought. Is there a diversity problem within the AI community as they're thinking about how to develop this technology? I mean, it, it's certainly very skewed demographically. Sure. Um, th there is also a, a fair amount of um, interest in this issue amongst the AI community and, and efforts to try to encourage underrepresented groups to play a bigger role. I think if one is worried about the biases in the product, I'm not sure they are coming from the fact that the people developing it are in our demographic. It's also, say, the data that you ingest into your algorithm. So if, 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 if for example, you have something that tries to do, say, like, like a controversial example, like predictive policing, where mm -hmm. you try to anticipate where crime might be and then pre-position constables so you could arrest them, right? That, that's got to obviously reflect where crime is and where crime is viewed to be and, and existing socioeconomic conditions. And so if, if the data you take in is biased for one reason or another, then unless you deliberately apply corrections, the, the algorithms will kind of reflect back the way the world is. So what kind of protections as these things, uh, policing is a big thing. I, I, you might have know, uh, seen that Amazon's shareholders recently voted, um, it, the vote didn't go through, but they voted whether or not to allow facial recognition technology to be sold to governments. Um, there are inherent problems with that, but what, what kind of safe, as this technology gets in the hands of governments, it's happening in China right now, for example, the people developing it, what kind of safeguards or blocks do they need to put in place? What, what, and what is being done and what hasn't been done yet? It, it's a very tricky thing. Um, among some of the leading AI researchers, there, there is the sense of, um, amongst many of them, as a, a bigger responsibility. They, they're kind of idealistic. Many, they want to feel that this thing they're building will do some good in the world. And, and uh, amongst their sort of top tier research, there's still a very great scarcity of talent. So they have a lot of opportunity, right? So they can uh, afford not to work for an employer that they've 
feel is you know slightly iffy in terms of their mission. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be able to recruit the best talent, like it's it's traditionally been hard. If if you have been a government or a military or a, a purely for-profit company with no story to tell about how you're gonna change the world for the better. Mm -hmm. um, so and and there have been these efforts underway to. You know, DeepMind, OpenAI, some of these other labs that are actually aiming for artificial general intelligence to try to consult um, with people outside their own groups to try to sort of bring ethical principles into to their core. But but how you do that in a competitive marketplace? So if if you are a company that that doesn't sit on this kind of semi-monopolistic situation, which gives you flexibility, you don't always have to do the profit-maximizing thing. Right, if you are a monopolist, let us say, but but if you are fighting in a perfectly competitive market, anything you do that is not profit maximizing will just kind of mean that you go out of business. So there, there you would have kind of much less opportunity, even if you wanted to, to be shaped by ethical considerations. So I'm glad you brought that up. The profit part of it. I know there are some nonprofit organizations out there. I think OpenAI is what, what one of them might be called. Um, well. They used to be. They used to be, and then yeah. they changed, right? They so changed. What, yeah, yeah, it's very interesting. There? Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it sounds kind of a little bit bizarre. People critiqued them a lot. They thought it was a marketing stunt. Um, so they um, they went to a kind of limited um, profit corporation where um, the payouts to investors is capped at 100x. Right. Right. Which sounds like, I mean, 100x. Uh, hardly anything delivers 100x anyway. So if you cap it at that. It's not really a sacrifice, but but there is this idea, and, and maybe, maybe it's a low probability, long-term thing. But if AI actually one day really were to succeed, you know, this thing I alluded to earlier, then the potential bonanza is enormous. I mean, we're talking about the kind of the future of the universe, right? So in that situation, it makes sense um, to pledge that if if that ever were to happen, right, then the surplus above 100x. Right? will go to some bigger goal than enriching the investors or even enriching the country where this happens. So this common goods principle, I think, should actually, it would be a good idea if that became embedded so that as we move towards this future, th there is this sense that if, if one day we develop machine super intelligence, like everybody will face the risks associated with that right. wherever you are in the world, uh, and everybody also should have some slice of the upside if it goes well. Now, you could say that instead of having everything above a certain level belonging to humanity, may maybe it should sort of be once a certain level, then 95% of whatever that exceeds that. So you still have kind of incentives to keep. But yeah, something like that. I, th I, think, I think they actually were, I think that's what it looks like if you try to take ethics seriously in this. Uh, it doesn't look like you put together some bo ethics board with you know, maybe very diverse and it, it like people, ideally non-controversial people, I right. suppose, and then they meet a couple of times a year. I, I don't think that's what it looks like. What it looks like is you do things that kind of don't really make sense, that seem weird, if, if this wasn't what you had in mind, that maybe even create some negative publicity. Um, you know, being ethical is not meant to be cost-free. But don't you think just our environment right now doesn't won't enable something like that, whereas you know, the comp many of the companies and people at the forefront of these technologies, like you said, are for-profit companies, and they're in a competitive landscape here in the United States. Our tech companies are in a massive competitive uh, battle right now with the same technologies being brought up in China, for example. The, the dynamics there aren't in place to make something like what you just proposed should be happening happen. Are we going to get to a point where it, it becomes too much, and they, they build this thing that they can't control? Well, I think there are several questions wrapped yeah. in, into one there. I mean, I think this kind of windfall clause could be feasible um, for profit, profit companies, given that these scenarios where you have machine intelligence optimizing the future of the Litecoin, they're not really actually part of what makes investors invest and in the business plan, right? These are kind of totally outside what actually shapes decision. So. If people don't actually believe that this will happen, it should be a free thing to promise that, right? It's not actually a sacrifice to promise to do something in a certain scenario that you're pretty sure will never happen. Mm. So uh, now actually would be the time to get this kind of windfall clause in. Um, in terms of the room for taking costly moves, well, I think one is some of these big tech companies are not in a perfect com 
competition market, right? I mean, they sit on a kind of semi-monopolistic assets, network effects, economies of scale, and mm -hmm. so forth. And, and these sums that are invested in AI research, although big in absolute numbers, are small in relative terms compared to the overall scope of these companies. So it's, it's a small thing. Plus this thing that I alluded to earlier, which is that it's easier to recruit top tier talent if, if you're actually credibly working towards something that would be beneficial. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think those two factors combine right now to give some room for, for idealistic moves to be made if, if, if there's the will and vision to do that. And if the companies can't handle it themselves, should the government step in? Well, I think if we're talking about regulation, uh, we want to distinguish the near term and the long term. In the near term, I don't, I mean, that, that might, yeah, I think you have to look at it case by case. Um, you know, maybe, maybe if there's going to be self-driving cars, there has to be something that certifies that they're safe, just as there are yeah. with other vehicles. Um, I mean, so far, I think the benefits have far outweighed the harms. Uh, and I think it, it's a difficult thing for regulators to really do because it's a fast-moving technical field. You know, governments are very slow. They don't have much expertise here. One would worry, therefore, that if they became more actively involved, that they would do thing, make things worse rather than better. Right. Uh, and as for the long term, I think uh, it's premature there. We would need to better understand first what the problems are. And, and may, maybe later there would, would be some role for governments. but. I, th I think that's kind of beyond the horizon right now for, for government. Efforts. Yeah, and we're seeing that problem now just with the more immediate issues, not necessarily related to AI, but when in all this talk about tech regulation, at least here in the United States, it's abundantly clear that our lawmakers don't have, a f or many of them, don't have a full grasp of the technology they're being asked to look into to p potentially regulate or break up and so forth. So that's, if, if they can't get that now, I can see the concern of this futuristic stuff and this AI, how they would have problems on the road. That, that, that seems very likely. I mean, in Europe, there have been various attempts with this kind of data privacy and so forth. Yeah. I, I don't really know whether it made things better or worse or not. I don't have an opinion on that. But yeah. um, there has been a lot of interest among governments. I think so far, it's mainly taking the shape, let's commission some big report. Um, which, which is a sensible place to start. You try to build up some capacity in-house to get some people to know about these things by doing these activities, uh, but, but a fairly sort of hands-off. And, and then some kind of attempts to invest. It's when Canada has actually been, I think, at the forefront of kind of actually government wanting to enable this and fund some research and scholarships and stuff like that. Yeah, Toronto here. Yeah, it's yeah, a yeah. And big tech city. Toronto and Montreal are like yeah. big, big AI cities. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is um, we're, I want to zoom forward into the future. Uh, I think Jeff Bezos has famously said we're in the first inning or the first bat at the first inning of w what artificial intelligence is capable of. Let's fast forward. What is the ninth inning, to use the baseball metaphor? What, what is, is the, what, the ninth? The, the ninth. Oh, you might know. I'm not American in the baseball. baseball thing, but it's, that's the last. That's the, the ninth inning. Where, where are we at at the end at the end game? Where what what does AI compare to what we have today? What people in this room are familiar with with Siri, Alexa, and so forth, and the machine learning algorithms they're putting in. We're at the very beginning of this game. What does the end game look like? I, mean, I, I wrote this, this, this book called Super Intelligence, and I think the answer is in the title. The answer is what? Super Intelligence. Super Intelligence. And is that, what does that mean exactly? It, it means that all the things we can do can be done much more efficiently and faster by machine minds. And what, um, what is our role in that? I mean, is that dangerous to us as humans if everything's done for us? Or? Uh, well, I mean, there, there are a number of challenges involved in that kind of transition. So one is technical AI safety. You need scalable uh, methods for controlling AI systems. Ultimately, that would be far uh, smarter than we are. So that's now a technical research field. I mean, we have one group at my research center that does this, working with DeepMind, there's like a number of other groups now. This didn't really exist as a field uh, four or five years ago, but yeah. now, now there are some smart people. So that's one, right? That's a technical problem. Then you need some kind of answer to the governance challenge. Like in, in a world, if, if there's going to be a world with machine super intelligence, it's super powerful things, like what does a positive, internationally cooperative way of using this technology look like? So we don't use them as we have with so many other technologies to wage war against one another or to oppress one another, but for some kind of actual positive beneficial thing, right? 
Um, and if you solve those two, then, then, then you have the third, which is actually the problem you want to have, which is think about what would the ideal life look like if you could remove these instrumental constraints, if you didn't have to work, if you didn't have to do a lot of things. It would free us up for a lot more. Sorry? It would free us up for a lot more things. Yeah, but for what exactly? Yeah. Right? We'll find um, out. So that, that's a big, more philosophical problem. I mean, I think that's less urgent because if we solve the other two, we'll have a lot of time and opportunity to wrestle with the third. But ultimately, you need good solutions to all of those three to get the utopian future. Great. Well, that's all the time we have. And luckily, we have someone like you working on all these big problems. Nick, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.